Hello and welcome, I'm Maria from Sew Through Time, and this time we're making a Viking era outfit from about 1000 AD that would have been worn in Northern Eastern Europe. So even though this is a Viking era outfit, this isn't what would have been worn basically by the Vikings themselves necessarily. And another thing we need to get out of the way in the beginning is that even though we're talking about Viking era fashion and what they actually wore, um, this is of course a best guess. First of all, I am not an expert in the Viking era, but I have done my best to do the research to give you accurate information. And even the best information that is out there is at best a guess, because when we're talking about 1000 year old fashion, there isn't primary sources that we can really look at. And all we really have is mostly just fragmented garments in grave sites and fragmented fibers in grave sites. There are a few survivor, uh, surviving pieces. Those are mostly found in bogs and things like that where the material around it uh, uh, preserves the garments so that they last because normally if you just put a garment in the ground it will not last a thousand years especially in most of the soil that is found in northern Europe which is not good for really preserving textiles or even metals that for that matter. So when we're talking about anything this old, we're not talking about historical accuracy because we can't be accurate. Not only like even just a few hundred years uh, into the past, we can't actually achieve full accuracy because not only are our modern fabrics woven in a very different way, the looms are a different width, um, the fibers are treated differently, and also, especially if we're talking about, nat well, of course we're talking about natural fibers, but if we're talking about things like wool and sheeps, there aren't that same breed of sheeps even that were a thousand years ago. And the few that are that old breeds, their fur or the fiber wouldn't necessarily be exactly the same because their diet has changed. The grasses, everything around us because of agriculture, because of modern industrialization has changed. So nothing is exactly the same as it was in the past. So we couldn't even achieve that. On top of that, these are just best guesses. Mostly what we have surviving from a thousand years ago are grave finds. And sure, most likely what they wore was pretty similar to what they were buried in. But for all for all we know, like if we would end up coming up with a time machine and we could actually end up in that era and we'd be wearing our like best guesses and then everybody would be running away from us because they'd be like, oh my God, the zombies are coming because we would be dressed like the dead. We don't know. Like, it's just guesswork at best at this point. And another thing to keep in mind is that Northern Europe, especially Scandinavia, is very sparsely populated and is also kind of behind in times. So the Viking era is solidly in the Iron Age, even though time-wise, it actually coincides with early medieval times further south. So what did they wear? Well, most likely next to skin, you would have a linen layer or a wool layer, depending a little bit on the seasons and which properties you'd want. Linen fiber comes from the flax plant and is a long staple, durable fiber. It is a bad breeding ground for bacteria and is very resistant to mold. It has excellent moisture wicking capabilities and can retain a large amount of moisture, making it ideal for hot and humid conditions and for keeping sweat off the outer garments. And because it's resistant to bacteria, it helps control body odor. So all in all, a perfect fiber for wearing next to the skin. Wool, on the other hand, comes from sheep and they need to be sheared twice a year to keep the animals happy and healthy. It also is a poor breeding ground for bacteria and is even self-cleaning, meaning that most of the time a good airing out is sufficient to keep the garment clean. The fibers have a strong wave or crimp to them, helping the fibers stick together and form an airy textile. This, along with the fact that it is very thermal resistant, makes it an excellent insulator, be it from the cold or the heat. 
It absorbs moisture slowly and can retain large quantities of it without feeling wet to the touch or feeling cold, making it ideal for cold or wet conditions. And this was an underdress, much like a smock or shift later on. And then there was basically a, the same si sort of shape of an other underdress that was wool. And you could layer more and more of these dresses depending on how much or how little you needed to protect you from the elements. So you could, like, we don't know how many they typically wore, but you can definitely layer as many as you need depending on the weather or as few as you need depending on the weather. There aren't many surviving garments, but there is one bog find from Denmark, and that is basically made out of different shapes of rectangles and triangles. So that is our best guess that most likely most underdresses would be made this way. And medieval shifts and uh, garments were typically made like this, so most underdresses are either patterned like an early medieval underdress or like that bog find from Denmark. They would be long sleeved and they would be fairly long. By our best guesses, they would be somewhere between your shin length so that your knee is definitely covered and then to about ankles. You don't want to go much further than ankles because if it goes much further than that, then you'll start picking up the moisture from the ground onto your hem and that will make you much, much colder. And because this is an era where definitely people still lived with the elements, even the richer people. So even though in the medieval era and going further into the Renaissance, you'll definitely see especially richer people wearing garments that would drag on the ground. As far as we know, garments of the Viking era changed very little during the era and that there's it's more nuanced in more, more of the jewelry actually so even though i'm saying that this outfit is going to be about from 1000 ad that's mostly based on my jewelry so the actual outfit could be a hundred years earlier even i didn't film the making of the linen underdress because it's basically made the same way as the wool one with felled seams except that it's made using the medieval pattern the wool underdress that goes on top of the linen one, I made using the Danish bog dress pattern. And basically the way I do it is that I draw the shapes directly onto the fabric and cut it like that. In the era, they would have most likely woven the fabric directly to the correct width. But because I'm using already ready-made fabric, I obviously can't do that. So for the basic body rectangles, I'm using the widest part of my body and then just the chorus add the ease to that. are all flat felled so I start with a running stitch which is common to see in Norse area medieval garments so I figured that this would also be a technique used earlier. The seams with a woven edge are just felled down without turning the edge while the seams with raw edges are turned and then felled down. Now after the underdress comes the overdress, and this style kind of determines a, partly where the person is from. If the person is from Denmark, uh, Baltic countries, or Finland, or even parts of Sweden, I think, but I'm not 100% sure about Sweden, most likely they would wear a peplos type of uh, overgarment uh, or gown, and if they lived in like the more 
like Birka area or other parts of Sweden where the actual Vikings were, more typical garments for them would be the apron dress. And then if the person would be from Gutland, they would most likely wear a peblos, but that would be a much more voluminous peblos than most of the other Northern Europe. So basically the difference between a peblos and this apron dress is that a peblos is just one rectangle that is woven in one piece or sometimes two pieces and is tied with a belt and then it is connected with buckles usually, or if you didn't have that, then maybe some sort of needles or some sort of pins or something. But it would be worn like that, so that it hooks somehow to your shoulders and then it's just a rectangle tied with a belt. Whereas the apron dress has separate shoulder straps and these shoulder straps could be often worn with the same buckles that the peblos would have on the shoulders, but they would be lower down, holding the straps to the front of the apron dress. And this garment would usually have just rectangles and triangles again, much like the underdress. Though in that garment there is more variation in the shape, there is some that have some sort of tucks on them and shaping of some sort, so that apparently some of these might have been more form-fitting and provided some bust support. Whereas the Pebla style, that is just loose. It does not provide really bust support of any kind. And after the Peblos comes another regional variation. So if you were in the Baltic countries or in Finland, you would most likely add a wool apron on top. And this could be very fancily decorated with different sorts of bronze spirals that could be connected either just on ends or all around the apron, or they could even have really fancy patterns on the bottom of the apron and sometimes on the top. For most of the Viking era, these aprons would actually not have any ties to them. They would just be the rectangle and then the belt would hold them to your body. When after the Viking era, when we come to the Crusade eras, meaning the era where there was crusades up north, then that in that era they would most likely have some sort of ties on the apron. So this kind of helps date the garment a little bit. So this puts my dress solidly in the Viking era. In the era both the peblos and the apron would have been woven to size, and the starting and finishing edges would have been finished with a woven hem. Morgan Donner has a video on how to do this technique, and I'll link it down below, but for a faster, more modern finish, I went for a narrow rolled hem instead. To create the bronze spirals for the corner decorations on the apron, I take a 1mm wire and twist it around a size 1.5 knitting needle into a long spiral. Then I cut them down to size, four loops for the shorter ones and seven for the longer. Each corner has four longer spirals and seven shorter ones. The spirals are connected with a wool yarn. I'm using a fingering weight and I start by securing the end by weaving it into the fabric with a needle, much like you would with knitting. Next I take one longer spiral, one shorter one, and another longer one and secure them to the edge of the fabric. Then I bring my needle back through the last spiral and add a shorter one and a longer one again. And again secure them to the edge of the fabric. And after securing it I once again bring my needle through the last spiral and add yet another short one and my last long one. And again secure it to the edge of the fabric and bring the needle through the last spiral. Then I add another short spiral and bring it through the last short spiral. And continue this until there's one short spiral on top and in the between each of the long spirals. socks would be used to cover the feet. And of course knitting wasn't invented yet, nor were the medieval hose really a thing yet. 
those would be a woven sock basically but instead they would use null bound socks and null binding is the oldest version of making things with thread that we know of especially for socks you can find really old ones like i i can't even remember how many thousands of years old the oldest egyptian one is but basically null binding has been done all over the world and null binding is done using one needle you could use different thicknesses of needles they could be made out of wood they could be made out of bone or even some metals and it would be a thicker needle more like a darning needle or even thicker and then you would take just a so short piece of yarn and then you would knot it using different sorts of patterns there are many different ways of doing null binding but basically you just knot the thread around or the yarn around and then you just attach more yarn to that yarn as you work so instead of working on a skein or a bigger piece like that, you work, work in short increments, about a yard or two yards long, not much longer than that, because then it becomes hard to carry it through with the needle. Most of the gray findings of socks are fairly short, only ankle length or it's slightly above, but there is at least one gray find from Finland that has a longer sock or fibers, wool fibers, that it's basically because there isn't an existing sock anymore. It's wool fibers around the shin area that is underneath the layers of garments. So most likely that would have been the sock. But because there's very little fragments left in graves anyways, we don't know really exactly that was this just not very common to have longer socks or was there maybe another reason like my theory is that maybe they just put the shorter socks in because those were used as kind of like slippers indoors and then you would want to because you'd be like you'd think that maybe in Valhalla you wouldn't freeze <laughs> and instead you'd want to leave those for the living those longer wool socks that could actually be useful because again fibers were expensive it was hard to produce clothing so you'd use most garments till the end of their lifespan and even after that were rags and different things like that but like i said that's just my theory i have absolutely zero evidence for this but like it just makes sense to me because my feet freeze all the time and i would want the longer socks especially in the co northern cold areas for my null bound socks i'm using an oslo stitch this wraps one piece of the working yarn around your thumb and then you pick up two loops from the work, one that you have already stitched through and then through that thumb loop. This creates a knot pattern that is fairly elastic and flat and comfortable for your feet. There are many other stitch options. This one just makes the most sense to me so that's why I'm using it. And as for shoes, I'm not making leather shoes this time, but most likely what they would have used is different sorts of slipper type of shoes. Some are a similar style as earlier medieval shoes, but also another popular style, at least throughout medieval times and in many other areas, So because there's so little finds. So we assume that it's also used in Scandinavia and Eastern Europe. Um, is the style of shoe that has basically it's made out of one piece of fabric or not fabric leather and then there's a seam at the back and then at the toe and then it just gathers around kind of like a pie thing on your foot another possibility especially for winter footwear is a kind of winter boot made out of fur instead of just leather similar to what the sami people would have used and here's the finished outfit with all the layers together. The Peblos is a 60 inch square. The temperature was in the upper 60s or about 20 degrees Celsius. The day I filmed this and I was perfectly comfortable and I think I would have been comfortable in it even if it was hotter or slightly colder. The garters and the belt are tablet woven. I personally could not be bothered with learning it right now so I just bought them ready made. 
both my rings are in typical Viking motifs and I'm wearing a knife at my belt. This would have been a utilitarian item used for everything from eating to cooking and wherever you need to cut anything. And the brooches are a copy of ones found in a wealthy Finnish woman's grave from 1000 AD. This outfit with its rich, vibrant colors and lots of details would most likely have been a better outfit for a fairly wealthy lady. So definitely not a work dress for dirty tasks. My hair and my head is left uncovered because Christian values had not re yet reached Northeastern Europe. My knotted ponytail hairstyle is based on a little Valkyrie figurine that was found from the era. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, please give it a thumbs up because it really does help out in this world. And please remember that there's no room for bigotry in Valhalla. And if you haven't already subscribed and you'd like to do that, please feel free to do that so that I can see you again next time. Bye!